Our next talk is by Paul Fritz and Daniel Perez on smart contract upgradability. Thank you. Right, so we're uh, basically we did a little study of smart contract upgradability in DeFi, and I'll start by giving a bit of a background on the typical patterns of upgradability you see, and then we have a little tool that uh, scans smart contract bytecode for patterns of upgradability, and we'll present some results from that. So as we know, by default, basically a theorem is immutable. You deploy something, the code can't be changed. Um, but that obviously leads to some problems for protocols that want to be maintained or need to be maintained. So many work around that by basically making their contracts upgradable. Um, and we typically find two patterns of upgradability. One is the proxy pattern, and one is what we call a contract setting pattern. So the proxy pattern works by um, essentially having a proxy contract that only has some kind of entry point code and then delegate calls a logic contract with the actual code that writes back to the storage of the proxy contract. And this logic contract can be exchanged um, through governance or whatever mechanism um, that, that is built in. Um, a perhaps more simple pattern is the, the other one that's commonly found is the contract setting pattern where you essentially have uh, similar structures. You have an entry point contract with some minimal code and then you have an address pointing to some logic contract that actually executes uh, whatever logic um, is needed is needed for the protocol and the address of this contract again can be changed um, and through some sort of governance. Um, and here for governance, so the way we typically execute upgrades, um, we again have two patterns. So one of them is on-chain voting, where you have some kind of voting mechanism implemented on-chain. Users stake, lock their tokens, uh, governance tokens, and then, and then agree on some kind of code upgrade that's to be executed or the change of an address. Um, and the other one is uh, having just a multi-sig wallet that basically executes upgrades with, uh, or executes any kind of changes with um, some off-chain voting in some cases. Um, on top of that, we have, we have basically, usually we have some time lock that basically delays the actual execution of an upgrade, um, which gives users some time to react to changes, um, but also limits the ability of protocols to, to react to some problems in a, in a quick way. Um, yeah, and for, for both of these patterns, so basically there is some trade-off between this gatekeeper functionality of, of having a multi-sig with some knowledgeable people that, that can, uh, can assess if, if an upgrade introduces some bug or some other problem. Um, but, but then also having the trust requirement that basically this multi-sig doesn't do anything malicious. So we would consider the difficulty of executing an upgrade um, or some kind of change in the protocol to be higher for, for uh, the on-chain voting version rather than the multi-sig version. I'll hand over to you for our little tool. All right. Let's see. I think it should. <laughs> the shaking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so I'll go on and talk a bit about uh, what we have done uh, for so for this talk. And um, so first, so we here we have like a small uh, taxonomy, um, and I'll give uh, more details about all the protocols uh, later in some case studies. But here, so on the x-axis, we have so the extent of upgradability. Uh, so we're like the on the left side would be like uh, where you cannot upgrade much, you can maybe change a few parameters or do, do a few things, but there's not really, you cannot change the behavior of the contract. And like on the rightmost side would be where you can basically change every, everything, all the contracts, really, really any sort of code uh, in there could be changed. And on the y axis here, we have the difficulty of executing upgrades. So where the lowest point here uh, would be just like a single address that is able to do so, uh, or maybe some multi sig that is able to. And on the highest one would be some sort of on-chain governance with also some time locks and this sort of things. Uh, so here we can see there are like fairly, uh, and yeah, something quite important to mention here is that, well, we want uh, typically to have, so if the protocol is highly upgradable, we want the upgrades to be uh, very hard to perform for kind of obvious reason, but otherwise like it would be super easy to do some sort of rug pull by upgrading the contract to something more malicious and so on. Uh, and so we see that like, yeah, different protocols tend to handle this in very different ways. So here we, we picked like some of the biggest DeFi protocols around uh, for analysis, but we can see, for example, something like Curve um, or Convex Finance uh, are basically mostly immutable for, for pretty much everything. Uh, and for the few things they need to change, it's quite easy to change because it's, it doesn't really impact too much the users in terms, at least like the uh, the multi-sig that is able to control these things would not be able to rug pull or to perform any uh, particularly malicious action uh, through this. So they, they didn't, 
they don't need to like put that much effort into preventing these. And for some other, for example, compound, Ave and Maker all fit in this category, but uh, all, almost all the protocol is basically upgradable. So it could be um, pretty much any part of these could be upgraded, but they made this fairly difficult to upgrade because for pretty much all of these, so they go through a governance process where people have to vote and once this is uh, the vote has been finished, the uh, proposal is, will be executed, there'll be typically some time delay um, before the action is, is actually executed, w during which time people can review things, make sure like if they want, do not agree, want to withdraw money, they can, they have time to react and, and this is mostly how most, how like these protocols are, are currently working. Uh, so first what we, so to, to, to produce this, what we did is we uh, came up with a small tool to try to detect uh, which contracts are upgradable, which are not, so we so to kind of have a better idea of about where to look and what to focus on for this talk. Um, and so what we did, so uh, of the two patterns uh, that we described uh, previously, we focused mostly on the proxy one, uh, mostly because it's like much simpler to detect. Um, and so there is like uh, an EIP that uh, describes like how to produce these uh, proxy contracts. Uh, and it defines like a few slots uh, on storage where like so some, uh, so the implementation address and the admin address and a few other things, I think, um, should be stored. And so this makes it quite easy for a contract that follows this uh, EIP to find them because they will always have basically the um, hard-coded address of this slot in, in the bytecode. So we can just look at the bytecode of the contract uh, and then see if, uh, if they are uh, performing a store, so in a store, in a load uh, from one of the, uh, of the, of the storage location. Um, and for other contracts uh, that ha use a proxy pattern but uh, do not follow this exact EIP, so do not use this uh, storage slots, then it's a bit more difficult. So there are like a few heuristics that can be done, some of which we implement. So among which, for example, like looking if there is a function called, implem a function called implementation that takes no argument, which is typically like what uh, contracts use to actually get, uh, get the proxy address. And obviously there are so far, there are also like other ways to implement this uh, upgradability um, and also like for the contract setting patterns, this becomes quite tedious. There, we could use some heuristics and so on, but like it barely would result in very likely many false positives. So we decided for this not to focus on, on, on the um, contract set setting pattern and only on uh, this particular one. Uh, and so this is uh, basically how we kind of uh, derive what we derived uh, for by looking at all the contracts um, in, the, in the protocol we showed earlier. So we can see like, um, as we could see on the, on the graph, uh, these protocols use, have very different kind of views on what should or should not be upgradable. Uh, one thing here to mention though is that MakerDAO is very upgradable, but it's not shown here simply because our tool cannot detect the con uh, contract setting pattern, which is a, a pattern used by MakerDAO. Uh, but for Curve and Convex, both are like extremely immutable. Um, well, yeah, Aven, Aven Compound, we can see here that it's, it's barely like, a, there's a lot that is upgradable. And for Compound also like the main uh, core contract logic as well as the LP token also upgradable. So all, all the kind of important parts of the protocol are. Um, and for Curve, we were a bit surprised because it sort of was fully immutable, but apparently there's some voting uh, contract that is taken from some other, uh, other project uh, that appears to be, also I, I don't think they actually use uh, the upgradability there. Um, and so, yeah, so Bailey, with this there, are many different trade-offs of these two approaches. Um, and so what we decided to do was to do some sort of case study and look at how things have been going and like mostly at look at what can go wrong, uh, wrong with both, uh, both sides of things. Uh, and the first one that we looked at was uh, Compound. Um, so Compound, they have this like m sort of main core contract called the controller that, that does uh, many things, among other things, deciding on the rewards given to the users. Uh, and this is also fully upgradable. Um, so there's are, uh, and they, they do upgrade this like fairly regularly uh, through governance update and so on. And this was actually, um, and they also have a time lock. Uh, currently I think it's two days. I think previously it was seven days. So really like once they decide to upgrade their, com their controller thing, um, they need to wait a few days before they, it actually gets, uh, gets upgraded, which as long as everything works, um, that's great. That um, leaves the user plenty of time to react and it, it prevents terrible things from happening. Um, but yes, yeah, there was, I think, quite a couple months ago, if I remember, maybe one or so, um, where um, they had a governance uh, upgrade that would 
uh, change a bit how um, tokens or how um, yeah, rewards are distributed. Um, and so they had a very subtle bug here, which um, resulted in this condition, the supplier index not being set properly, um, because the supply index greater than comp initial index should have been greater or equal. But this part of the code was not even changed uh, during this, uh, this upgrade, only some other uh, part of the code that would set uh, the default um, supply index to be the exact same value as comp, comp initial index, while it used to be zero. Uh, it, um, and this, because of this, basically, the supplier index would not be set to the current index. And this would result in, sh in some huge delta here and distribute tons of tokens to the user. So um, this resulted in, I think, some, something around like $90 million worth of uh, rewards uh, being distributed. And basically, like this was known. Uh, I mean, what, what was this was discovered. Obviously, they proposed um, another change to revert this, but they had this time lock of one week, and really every single person who could have used this bug to to get money uh, prob probably used it. Um, and I think that's after that they reduced the time the time lock uh, and so on. But that's kind of one of like the major inconvenience with this sort of like extremely. Um, Sorrow process to actually uh, use this uh, this upgrade is that it's almost impossible to react to to problems that occur uh, on chain. So um, then there is this other way, um, this other problem that was on MakerDAO. This actually we um, had this in another paper uh, that we uh, presented a while ago with Le Louis was here. Um, and this is also one of the problems attached with like ev everything being upgradable is that as long as governance is going well and there is no, no kind of attack on this governance process, everything is kind of smooth. I mean, obviously, if there is no, no bugs too. Uh, but if the governance process um, is attacked, it can result in terrible things. And so um, that was for a maker that was, uh, I think, six months ago or so, if I remember. And thankfully, like, the attack was performed uh, really for something that was not super important, like getting so, some token as, as a collateral uh, or something like this, but the, the attacker could have stolen basically the, almost everything in the in the in the protocol. Um, and the problem here was that um, people could use fl uh, flash loans to vote uh, because they didn't have anything to protect protect against this. Um, and so I think November last year they they added these uh, two lines of code that was uh, that should probably have been there uh, from the beginning. Um, but where yeah, basically they they make sure that the same user cannot. Uh, can, that a user cannot uh, lock and free in the same block, which, which prevents against this uh, flash loan attack. So something is, could still be possible, obviously, with like a lot of capital, but at least like that got fixed. Uh, and it's now kind of uh, OK. And finally, the third uh, sort of case study we went through is with Convex. Um, so they uh, did fix it very recently. Um, it was uh, still broken until, I think, maybe two, two weeks ago, maybe one month ago. I forgot exactly. Um, and so here, so Convex typically takes the approach of having everything immutable. Um, and I think that's more or less what they had in mind. But they had uh, some nasty code patterns that would mean that uh, an attacker could actually make something that should not be upgradable from the beginning uh, to start with. It could make it upgradable. Uh, and so we found this, this problem, which is that um, in their like, set staking contract, which was kind of meant to only be used when the contract is initialized. Um, they had a condition that they could actually make true, which is the like, uh, right-hand side here, minimum stake equals zero and maximum stake equals zero. Um, so what, mainly what the, so the multisig would have had the possibility of stealing all the locked uh, convex tokens, which is like around $3 billion uh, worth of uh, US dollars. And that was around for like, quite a long time. Um, and also, they fixed this for other reasons. And I think it's almost incidental that they uh, actually uh, fixed this particular problem. Um, but yeah, but so really what the multi could have done, and that could have been done in pretty much one block, um, is just setting these stake limits uh, both to zero, which was possible uh, given the code that they had, um, and then setting the con their staking proxy, uh, which is like the upgradable uh, contract where they store all their convex uh, tokens that have been locked, upgrades to some malicious contract that where they would have um, a way to, to withdraw all, all of it, and then stake the 
set these stake limits back to really force, uh, force the protocol to uh, withdraw everything at once, because there's, there's not like a withdraw function they could have used, but they could have forced uh, this contract really to, to uh, withdraw everything. And that yeah, um, would have been like a huge rug pull uh, possibility for the, should, should the multi sig have been uh, malicious here. Um, so yeah, so as a conclusion, um, so we showed like with, um, with, so we did this tool and showed that like there are like many protocols that are quite upgradable. Um, that it is kind of a necessary evil, but it comes with many trade-offs, mainly because of the trustless nature of, uh, of the blockchain. Um, and that there is obviously like so, some sort of frontier here that uh, some efficient um, efficiency to be had on how to design these. And obviously the more upgradable your contract, your um, protocol becomes, the, the more safeguards you will need. Um, but yeah, as, a, as it's currently designed, it, it makes it extremely hard to uh, react to, to these sort of problems. And there are currently also like quite a bit of work being done, improving the sort of uh, governance mechanism and so on. But so yeah, we do think like it's, it's Optimizing a bit more, like all this uh, governance mechanism, on-chain governance mechanism, will be kind of a key to make uh, smart contract reliability uh, viable in the in the longer term. Um, thank you. And if you have any questions, please.